I just wanted to, to share with you, um, tonight I know that God has something special for you. And the reason I know this is I thought I wrote this message for this time that I went to L.A., um, so I, I was going to LA, I was going to speak there just a few weeks ago, and I had this, uh, I had this plan of what I was going to do and how I was going to do it. So I had my plan, and we got on the plane, and I was on a four-hour delay in Miami in September, two of which were out air conditioning, no air conditioning, on the tarmac. So by the time I got there, I barely landed in time to go straight to the church. How many of y'all knew I needed a shower? So here's what I knew. I knew the Lord was in it. Everybody say, the Lord is in it. Because the enemy was fighting it. So they don't have a green room at this church. It's in California, and there's no extra space. So they had graciously rented a motorhome, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to get to rinse off. So I'm like, y'all, if I can have five minutes. They're like, okay, we'll do an extra song at worship. I run into the motorhome. I turn on the shower. I jump in the shower, and I go to dry off, and I realize <laughs> they had prepared for somebody to use the bathroom, but not for them to take a shower. So I got the little hand towels. And and dried off, and I went in, and while I was on that plane, God will use what seems like a delay for his purpose. And as I was sitting on that plane, I wrote this message. It came to me so hard and so strong, I just started writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. And as I got there, I started delivering the message that I'm getting ready to deliver tonight. And as I was delivering, I was talking about things being built earthquake proof. And I said, y'all don't know anything about earthquakes here in California. And they all start erupting. About the time I was trying to pat off in the motorhome, I thought I was just shaking the motorhome around. They experienced an earthquake (laughs) in LA right about the time I'm doing this message, y'all. And I thought, well, look at the Lord. I came home and they said, hey, we're doing a thing. We're doing a series called Heart for the House. And I said, oh, that, that hits my heart. And they started talking about the house and the things of the house. And I said, I need to turn my notes into UPD and the creative team. I've got a message I think is going to be perfect for your series. And he, they said, thank you very much. They took it. And PD said, Nicole, the Lord spoke to me. And you're supposed to give that message Tuesday night. And I said, yes, sir, I will do that. And then we were in another city this morning. We woke up late because the hotel had really bad traffic. We got up. We're headed out. I don't have devotion time. So I get home this afternoon, and I said, I need to study for tonight, but first I need to take my time with Jesus. So I opened up this devotional that I use sometimes called Jesus Calling, and I opened it up to the 23rd of November, which is also Liam's birthday. Everybody, Liam's one year old. Come on, Sunset Hill. Go ahead, just say, you. yes, proud grandma. Um, he's already walking, and when you ask him how old he is, he will tell you, one, <laughs> because he's just a genius, I mean. <laughs> and um, as I was reading it, I was reading my notes from last year that says Liam and Morgan are in the hospital. Liam was born at 7.07 a.m. Morgan is there by herself because they won't let anybody else in because of COVID restrictions. And when I read the devotion, I circled the word lullaby. Jesus knew I needed to know that he was taking care of my grandbaby in the hospital. And so as I'm reading that devotion again a year later, the scriptures that I'm preaching tonight are 1 Corinthians 3, if you have your Bible, verses 10 through 15. And if you read Jesus Calling, there's only two or three scriptures in the entire devotion. And in the devotion, one of the three scriptures they put down was 1 Corinthians 3, 11, that Jesus Christ is our sure foundation. And that's when I knew, I thought I wrote this for L.A., And I knew in my heart when I wrote this, this needs to be preached at our church. And I don't know when and I don't know where, but I had a burning on the inside of me that this was for Faith Church. I thought it was going to be preached by somebody else for the heart for the house. But look, God had it for you on November 23rd, 2021, the Tuesday night before Thanksgiving. The Lord himself, come on, somebody, has gone out before you. So if you're wondering, has God heard my prayer? The answer is yes. Does God know what I'm going through? The answer is yes. Does God have an answer for what I'm going through? The answer is yes. 
Yes, yes, he does. And so I want you to start your notes with this. You can't build a good house on a broken foundation. Because we're talking about building what? Building the house of God. We're talking about building our house, building our family. We're talking about building our lives. We're talking about building our careers. So when we get started, we got to talk about the foundation. So back in uh, 2005, I guess it was, 2004, Pastor David and I started pastoring. Ashton was three months old. Well, by the time Ashton was a year old like Liam, she was already wearing these breathing masks, and I had to give her these breathing treatments a couple times a day. We lived 35 highway miles, that's before you got off the highway, away from the church. So there was this little bay house right next door to the church that uh, was used for storage, but we kind of cleared it out, and I bought some stuff from a yard sale to fix up a bedroom, and we would stay the night there when we were there real late at night, and we'd have to get up early the next morning. We didn't know what was wrong with Ashton. All we knew is that there was that she was sick and something was going on. So finally one day we go down into the basement, which it was padlocked off because it was an old house and we, I guess we didn't want anybody to go down there. We never thought about it. We go down into the basement one day and the basement's real damp, it's real wet. We realize that, now I know people in Florida don't know nothing about basements, so basements are these places they put in horror movies. The places where the scared people always go when somebody's chasing them with a chainsaw and there's no way out. That is a basement. But just about every house in Missouri has one of these basements. And so we go down into this basement. It's wet everywhere. It's moldy. There's, there's water on the floor. And we realize after we tell the doctor about this, Ashton had been exposed to mold. So she'd been breathing in all of this mold because we were living in a place. When we looked at the wall, we saw there was this big crack in the wall. And this crack in the wall, this broken foundation, was letting in all of this thing. And she had been sick for a really long time, and we had never checked the foundation. I think that's what happens with a lot of us is we've got a symptom in some part of our life. And we're like, man, I don't know why I can't get happy. I mean, I don't know what is going on with like, I mean, I'm a good catch and I don't know why people can't get along with me. You know what I'm saying? Because I mean, look at all this. I mean, they got access that people should be happy about this. Or, or we're at work and we're like, I'm working my tail off, but they are passing me up for promotion after promotion. Or we're like, I don't know why. I'm like, I'm working hard for Jesus. and I don't know why Jesus doesn't just raise me up. And I have a question today. Are we checking the foundation? So go with me. How many of you want to go ahead and and take a look, go down in the basement with me for just a minute and check out, I promise you, there's nobody down there with chainsaw. But how many of you want to go down there with me today and take a peek at your foundation? Can we do that together? Okay, so 1 Corinthians 3 verse 10. It says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me. I have a quick question for y'all. Did God give you his grace? This says God's grace was given to me. Okay. So we have five years of grace and favor. We have five years of things that we did not deserve and we did not earn, but God's given it to us. We have five years of stepping into and onto a level that we should never be able to get to on our own. And that was given to who? It was given to me. Come on, everybody say it louder. Sunset Hill, say it. Me. That's what I'm talking about. So according to the grace, which we didn't earn and can't deserve, which was given to me, as a wise master builder. So I just want to pause there for a second and tell you, you might not think that you're a wise master builder. And I just want you to look at your girl for a second, take in my little cute shoes, and these are not work boots, and I'm not dressed appropriately for a construction site. But 35 highway miles down the highway on a farm is where your girl learned how to wire a plug. I can float concrete. What does that mean? You don't float on concrete. You get little floaties and you get in there and you swim in. Is that how that works? No, when you pour concrete, you get this big flat thing on an end of a stick and you push it around real hard and you make the concrete real flat and real smooth. I can float concrete. I want to let you know that I can lay a tile floor because my husband and I used to buy houses and flip them and rent them. And do you know why I learned to lay a tile floor? Because we learned my husband can't lay a tile floor. (laughs) (laughs) some things you learn by necessity. I tell you what, if you look around in your life right now, you might think that you're not building some things real wisely, but I'm here to tell you, you don't go by how you look. 
See, we're in the process right now. We just talked about this past weekend, Fairview Heights Campus. Well, I'm pleased to tell you I'm on a team of people, not by myself, working on building that campus. But our very first campus, our city, guess who the project foreman was for that project? It was me. When we built out Sunset Hills, guess who the project foreman was? It was me, and I brought along a a guy named Aaron Brentlinger with me. And when I showed up to that project, the foreman did not respect me at all. They took me aside, and they said, honey, look at you in your little shoes. This is cute. I know. They said, church said they were sending you out and put you in charge. That's so sweet. We'll let you know when we're done. Oh, aren't y'all sweet? Hey, I want to let y'all know I know how to read a spreadsheet and a calendar, and I don't know how you're going to get it all done, so we're going to work on this together. (laughs) They bought me a little pink tool bag and a little pink hard hat. Well, it got to be July, and we were way behind schedule, and we got way behind schedule. I decided that one welder is not going to get this whole job done in two weeks. So we talked about how many welders were supposed to be on the job, seven or eight. So you know the first thing I did every morning? I got up, got in my pajamas, drove over to the campus and made sure there were eight welders on the job. When they weren't, I'd called the foreman. When the foreman told me, don't worry about it, we're going to make it, and I knew we wouldn't, I'd call somebody else, and I'd call somebody else, and I'd call somebody else. Well, I want to let you know that when we crossed that finish line and got that project done on time, when we had bugged them and gotten on them and stayed on them. We crossed that finish line on budget. I came in there for the final meeting when we were going over all the final change orders and they said, hey, you know what? You came in here in the wrong shoes and you sure didn't look the part, but we want to let you know you can come on a job site with us anytime because you helped us keep the crews on time and on budget. Why do I share that with you? Because you're looking at your life thinking, I can't do that. I can't do that with this money. I can't do that with on this timeline. And I'm here to tell you, you're right. No, you can't. But with God, all things are possible. And God's got plans for you to build a life. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm a builder. Turn somebody on the other side and say, I'm building something good. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder. Say, that's me. me. I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds. So earlier today, we just got back in town. And one of the first things I did was go and take a walk on the beach. And I read a story about a guy who used to like to walk beaches and go exploring and see what he could find in like caves and crevices. And he went in this one cave. And up to that point, he hadn't found anything. And he goes in this cave and he finds these uh, clay balls like in this burlap sack. And he goes out and he takes them out in the sun. And he starts spreading them all around. And they really don't look like anything. And so he's just like, well... The biggest treasure I ever find in all these years are just these hard clay balls. Um, They're not worth anything. I can't do anything with them. So he did something really smart. He said, how can I glorify God with what I did find? So he's like, well, I'm going to pretend I'm Austin Schuler and I'm playing baseball in high school and I'm going to go up to the ocean and I'm going to see just how far uh, I can throw this into the water with the strength God gave me. That one went pretty far. Uh, He threw another one and another one. He thought, maybe I can try skipping them on the water. Yep, no, that that didn't go very far. And skip another one. Then he had a bunch, about 60 of these left in a bag, and he just kind of gave up. And he said, you know, all I really have is a bag full of invaluable dirt. And I wonder how many of us go through life looking at what God has given us and think, you know what? Really all I ended up with here is a bag full of invaluable dirt. And how am I supposed to build anything with this? And that was what made me think about my life in the past and how it was broken. I think that's the excuse we give God a lot of times, right? Is, um, you know, well, God, I would do some stuff, but, but you don't know what happened to me. And the thing I started thinking about when I was praying about tonight was my broken marriage. So I was, how many of you guys know I was married before? Say Amen. So I was married to a guy, it was not Pastor David, it was a guy that got hooked on drugs, and I was thinking about this time of year in Christmas, and I remember a Christmas um, that he was hooked on drugs, and, and things were just 
coming unraveled and I didn't know how to handle things. And I remember Austin and I, we had a Christmas tree and my ex-husband was in and out and he was unaccounted for and accounted for and things were, things were awful. And I remember one night with not one single gift under that Christmas tree, I crawled underneath the Christmas tree and I laid on my back and I looked up into the Christmas tree and I saw all the lights in the Christmas tree. And there was just a place where I could just breathe and have peace for just a minute. And I thought, I don't know how I'm going to get him any presents. My new marriage and my life is broken. It's fallen apart. My marriage is broken. My life is broken. I'm literally broke financially. I don't know how I'm going to pay the mortgage. I don't know where we're going to live. I'm working as hard as I can, but he's stolen everything. Literally was stealing the furniture out of the house, was stealing the car when I was going to work. And in Missouri, when you're married, he had as much right to everything in the marriage as I did. So he could, he could take everything and leave me with nothing. And there was nothing I could do about it. So I literally had nothing. And I thought, I don't know how I can get any more broken. And I was thinking about how we love to look at people's lives, especially on Instagram. How many of y'all on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, say me? And we start scrolling, we start looking at other people's lives, and we're like, oh, relationship goals. <laughs> I wish we had that. Can I get an amen? I'm here to tell you, I know you guys didn't do this, but maybe you girls did. I was going ahead and I was scrolling today looking how to do a lip highlight. <laughs> right? You're like makeup goals. You're like workout. My husband scrolls TikToks looking for workout hacks because Don Strange and his son, so he doesn't give enough of them, right? So he's, he's looking for those TikTok workout hacks. We're like, man, the life is looking so good. And we, we talk about the destiny like it has no drama. And we start thinking, uh, you know, well, we want to live their life, but then we run into trouble on the way to their life. And then we want to abort the destiny because of the drama, and I'm here to tell you, there's not one person sitting in either of these rooms or attending online right now, worshiping with us, who does not have a crack in their foundation. Turn to your neighbor and say, show me your crack. <laughs> Turn back to him and say, no, actually, no, no, we're good. We're good. I knew I was going to come up with a plumber joke in here. I just knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Now, let's keep all of our cracks to ourselves. Well, let's keep certain cracks to ourselves, but... You know, that's why we're getting into small groups, right? Because when you get with somebody and you get to know them a little bit, and you realize I was divorced and you were divorced, and I've been hurt and you've been hurt, and I've been betrayed and you've been betrayed, and I've been adopted and you've been adopted, and, and I've been molested and you've been molested, and I've been raped and you've been la raped, and I had a failed business and you had a failed business, and we find out we have these commonalities, and then we see where God has moved in their life anyway. Because, I mean, don't we serve a God of anyway? I mean, I was talking to somebody today and he was like, yeah, do you know what they called me? They called me a certain nickname when I was younger because I used to get high so much. They used to tell me I was fried all the time. And yeah, if I told you who this was, it would blow your mind. It's one of the best saints I'd ever met. And yet look what God did. God does not qualify you because you are perfect. He perfects every single one of us day by day along the way. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Come on, somebody praise him better than that. That's why when we, on December 4th, it's coming up here on a Saturday night, we're doing a tree lighting. And it is the perfect reason to invite hurting people to church on a Saturday night. We're going to do this hot cocoa bar. It's going to be so cute, y'all. We're going to have all these peppermint sticks and marshmallows and all these things to mix into your hot cocoa. We're going to sing carols under the trees. Because do any of y'all, are y'all like, like frustrated worship leaders? Like I am a worship leader stuck in a body that can't sing. And we're going to sing carols around the tree. And we're going to say, hey, just get your best, like, when the Grinch stole Christmas before the Grinch gets there. <laughs> That's going to be us on December 4th. That's why we want to invite somebody. Because there are some hurting people. And what's crazy about broken foundations is they really show up this time of year. People are alone, they're lonely, and they realize the relationships they don't have. And what the, what's crazy is when you get them here, when we repair our relationship with Jesus Christ... Somehow he begins repairing the other relationships in our life. Can I get an amen? amen? So you need to bring those people on December 4th. We're going to get around the tree. We're going to get them singing. Then we're going to bring them into service. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to show them our scars. Because that's the thing about life is people won't show us their scars on social media, but they'll show us their stars. Hey, look what I got going on for me, but not look at what it costs me. 
So see, I got one scar right here. I'm going to show you because I got the right pants on for this. See, I got this scar right here and this scar right. Oh, wow. I got this right here. Don't even know how I did that. But this one right here I got when I was five years old. I was riding my bike. And I was going around a corner. I was just learning to ride. Went around a corner, slid in some gravel, cut myself so bad that my mama had paid for swimming lessons and we were not well-to-do. She had paid for swimming lessons and I wouldn't go because I was scared the chlorine was going to burn my little cut. (laughs) I have a scar today. Here's the thing about scars. Scars don't hurt anymore. But we can still tell the story. You know, the thing is, I'm not the only person in this room with some scars. Tell me, if you got a scar, raise your hand and say me. You know, me and you aren't the only one with a scar. There's a man named Jesus. He's got some scars in his hands, and he's got a scar on his side, and he has got a story to tell. And his body was broken so that our body could be fixed. His spirit was broken so that our spirit could be fixed. His soul was broken so that our soul could be fixed. He took all of our sin upon him because he's our sure foundation. I'm here to tell you the depths of your wounds do not determine the height of your future. So... As we go to build, the problem is, you know, we, we, get in, we do get into groups when we're not in church, and we get in these groups of, like, self-help. Like, here's how you do it, right? Like, oh, we can fix your life. You come in here. You just read my book. You do my 10-step process. They're everywhere on Instagram. Everybody got a microphone. Ain't nobody got nothing good to say, right? And don't believe every preacher you hear just because they use alliteration and the desperation to give you some, some consternation of your immediation of the remediation that it's going to be okay in the nation. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like just because it sounds good doesn't mean that the doctrine is sound. And we start getting around these people and we start trying to build our own life back. And we're like, you know, I'm hurting and I'm broken. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read these self books and I'm going to fix myself. And if we could have fixed ourselves, sweetheart, we would have fixed ourselves by now. So it makes me think of a story um, with these three little pigs. And I'm not talking about you and your two friends after Thanksgiving. (laughs) No, I'm talking about these three little, I'm talking about these three little pigs and these three little pigs, they build these houses. And in these houses, the first one builds a house with straw and the house that he builds out of straw, he thinks it's great until the the big bad wolf comes along. And what does the big bad wolf do? He, and he, and he, you know, I think that's what happens when we try to fix our own breaks. We try to put our own life back together and Life huffs and life puffs and the house gets blown down. And then we start to thinking, but I already tried that. So then we get introduced to Jesus. Well, let's go back to the word and let's put the word in the middle of the three little pigs. First Corinthians three, verse 11. It says, no other foundation can anyone lay except that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anybody builds on this foundation with wood, hay or straw. So here we go. We're right here. Each one's work will become clear, it says, for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. Here's the thing. Fire is coming. It's coming to the good people. It's coming to the bad people. It's coming to the praying people. It's coming to everybody because there's going to be fire that comes along and help us figure out what are we doing and why are we doing it? What are we talking about today? We're talking about being broken, but building. We're talking about where we came from, and where we're going to. We're talking about what life dealt us and what God can do with it. So we come here and we're like, well, now I got introduced to Jesus. And now that I got introduced to Jesus, now I have Jesus. And, and we start here in parts of the word, but we don't really know the word. So then we mix it up with some of our own works. And we think, I know Jesus, so I'm going to work for him. And I know Jesus, so I'm going to build my life back. And I know Jesus, but... And so we think, we take a little bit of Jesus, but we had a whole lot of us. And then when the fire comes, let me ask you, is that wood going to burn in the fire? You know, sometimes life doesn't get built according to our blueprint. You know, when we were building, uh, when we were in Fenton and Ashton was in that little house with us, the church got too small for how big we had started building and everything, and people just started coming and coming and coming. We went from 200 people to 300 people to 400 people, and within two years, we were at 2,000 people in the exact same building. How many of you know you got a space problem? So we, we drew up all these plans with these architects to build in that space. It would give us more room. We could expand. It would be way better. The building was old. The building was ugly. We took it to the city, 
And the city told me this, you will never build that in this town. Well, I thought, well, yeah, yeah, we will, me and my team of attorneys. So I went and I told David, I said, well, they can't punk the church like that. I said, we can get an attorney and we're not going to just fight for us, baby. We're going to fight for everybody. He's like, yeah, girl, you tell them. And so I met with an attorney and they said, you have a case and it is strong and you are right and they are wrong. I'm like, yes, Lord. (laughs) So I was getting ready to go fight with the city, with my attorney and my rightness. Hmm. Isn't it funny how my rightness and Jesus' righteousness don't always add up? (laughs) We can be right, but we can be oh so wrong. And I'm getting ready to go head off the attorney, and Pastor David said, hey, baby, I was praying, and you're not supposed to fight that fight. I'm like, baby, that was the devil, and he needs to get behind you. (laughs) He said, no, baby, you're not supposed to fight that fight. So as bad as I knew, I was right. As bad as the blueprint made sense, When the fire came, it could have either burned it all down or I could put it down before it all got burnt. So I put it down and I walked away. I didn't want to. How many of you know submission ain't submission until you submit? Now I'm telling you about the one day I did submit, not the 3,682 I did not. So we walked away, and sure enough, in 2011, instead of building that out, we had all the blueprints sitting there. We had the life that I thought we were supposed to be living sitting there. We had the building on paper that I thought should be on that property sitting there. But that wasn't my building. That wasn't for us. Actually, God had another property at 13,001 Gravoy where you're sitting right now tonight getting the word preached to you. And at that point in time, it was about 90,000 square feet and it needed some remodeling, but there was a church that needed a home and they wanted the building that we had, but they said, we can't move into that place because it's a smaller building. People will think we're going backwards. And I said, wait a minute, I have some blueprints for you. And I pulled out these blueprints and I unrolled them on the table. I said, it doesn't have to look like that. It can look like this. And the price tag isn't bad. They said, this is gorgeous. I said, the only problem is the city wouldn't let me build it. You see, if you're trying to build your life to look like what you think it's supposed to look like, that might not be the life that God wants for you at all. He might want something much bigger and much better. So we gave them those blueprints and they went to go meet with the city. The whole time I'm like under a table going, oh, this is never going to work. This is never going to work. This is never going to work. They come out of the meeting with the city and you know what the city tells them? We have been waiting for somebody to come along and improve that ugly property. (laughs) It wasn't our blueprint. Y'all, we can't build out of straw because it's all going to blow away. We can't build out of wood because it's all going to burn down. But I do think it's interesting that when the third little piggy comes along and he builds his house out of stone, you know, I find it interesting that the Bible says that Jesus Christ is our chief corner stone and that he is our sure foundation, it says in 1 Corinthians 3.11. And when we build on Jesus... And when we do just what he wants us to do and how he wants us to do it, and when we walk away from the things that we think look so good for our life and we start doing what he wants to do for our life, he can take a girl who lived a third of her life on a gravel road who, didn't, who was adopted, raped, molested, busted, disgusted, divorced, foreclosed on, bankrupt on, and he, we look at our life and say, but God, I'm too broken. He says, no, baby, you're too perfect. The foolish things of the world can found the wise. It's not where you came from. It's where God is calling you to. And when you say, Jesus, I'll do anything you ask me to do. Jesus said, you're the person I've been looking to build with. You are a wise master builder. You have so much potential in your life. You know, when we hit rock bottom, we looked down at the bottom and realized that the rock that was down there the whole time was Jesus. And then we look at the rock, and it reminds me of the guy on the beach. Here he was, he was walking along on that beach, and he was 
throwing these things out. And all of a sudden he dropped one of them. And when he dropped it, it landed on a rock. And when it dropped on a rock, it cracked. And when it cracked, it started coming open. And when it came open, he noticed some stuff in it. And he said, I don't know what's in this right now. And so he started looking and he realized, hold on, there's a bunch of treasure on the inside of that. You know, what's funny in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, it says, we have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars, but we're containing this great treasure that makes it clear that our power is from God, not from ourselves. And when I read that scripture, I realized that the fragile clay had to be broken before anybody knew the value. And if you took this clay and you put it over a light bulb, you'd never see the light shine unless there was a crack in the clay. And that's what I believe about you and what you're building right now here at Faith Church. That's what I believe about you and what you're building at Fairview Heights. That's what I believe about you and and what you're doing in your heart and in your life and with your family. I believe that God has more on the inside of you because the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And he has this power that he's wanting to escape out of you, but he can't get the power out of you until you say, God, here is this crack and I need you to come and fill me, God. And he says, I've been trying to fill you. I just needed you to stop trying to fill yourself and fill it with the outside world. And when we sit there with our hands raised and our hearts open, he says, I have so much more for you. And you might be thinking, but that sounds great. You're, you're preaching. I'm an usher. I work in multimedia. I press buttons on a keyboard. I work in the portico. I just make people coffee. Isn't it funny how we put that just in front of what we do? That's the enemy trying to break your confidence. He's trying to break down your call. He's trying to break your qualification because I'm here to tell you when you serve your purpose in his house. You see, Jesus is building a house and he can't build it without you as a wise master builder. Have you ever tried to build a house with all electricians? Who's gonna put the walls up? Tried to build a house with all plumbers? We're not gonna get any lights. You ever tried to build a house with all drywall people? The house might be pretty, but it won't be able to do anything. You need different specialists in the house. And every specialist is important. I'll close with this story. There was this guy, his, his name was Edward Kimball, and he thought he was just a Sunday school teacher. And so he was just teaching his Sunday school, working with faith kids, no big deal, nobody cares, I'm not important. I'm a shoe store clerk. I sell shoes, that's what I do, I'm, I'm nobody. And Mr. Nobody went to work. He, but he had so much ministry in his heart, he didn't just do ministry when he was serving at church. He also did ministry when he walked out of the church. And there was this guy who came in and needed some shoes and the guy's name was D.L. Moody. And when he was giving D.L. some shoes, he said, I see a crack in your life and I know who can fill it and his name is Jesus. And he got a guy saved over selling him some shoes. Well, that guy, D.L. Moody, was so on fire for God, he traveled to England. And when he went to England, he started awakening people to Jesus. And he awakened this guy. His name was F.B. Meyer. He was this young and passionate pastor who got so excited. And he said, if D.L. Moody can come to England, I can go to the USA. And he started preaching on college campuses, converting people. And he had this one convert. His name was Will Chapman. Well, Wilbur Chapman attended a meeting one time after, after he got saved by F.E. Meyer, and it was a D.L. Moody conference. And while he was there, he went up, he said, I want to work with you. And he said, okay, let's work together. Well, they started getting so busy, Wilbur needed an assistant. And while he was working, he met this guy. He used to be a baseball player. His name was Billy Sunday. So Billy Sunday said, I want to work with you. And he started this thing that became known as the Christian Businessmen's Committee. And they started doing tent meetings all over the place. And they did this tent meeting in North Carolina. The guy preaching the meeting's name was Mordecai Ham. Mordecai started preaching, but this high school was kind of hard to get to. The parents were coming, but the kids weren't, especially this one kid. He was a little bit influential in the school, but he's like, I'm not going. Parents can't make me because I'm tough and I'm a kid. And the 
parents finally just gave up and said, God, we don't know what we're gonna do with them. But then this rumor started that there was gonna be this big fight at the tent meeting. So this kid said, I wanna go see this big fight. Yeah, so things that get kids, right? God can use anything. So they show up to see the big fight and they're waiting for the fight to break out, but they hear Mordecai Ham preaching. And he starts talking about how his life was broken, but that there was a Jesus that saved him anyway. And that was the night when he gave the altar call that Billy Graham came forward looking for a fight, but instead he got saved. Billy Graham preached to arenas of millions of people. Millions got saved under Billy Graham. And people say, Mordecai Ham got Billy Graham saved. I mean, I guess he did, but honestly, I think it was Edwin Kimball. I think it was a shoe store clerk. I think it was a faith kids teacher portico server, multimedia, faithful steward, person who made sure the church was unlocked and the doors were open. It wasn't all Mordecai Ham. It was Billy Sunday serving. It was D.L. Moody preaching. It was Wilbur Chapman assistant. Why do I bring that up in a message called Building the Broken? Because you look down on yourself and you think you aren't that much. And God just sent me here today to tell you, you are way more important than you think you are. You are a wise master builder. And when you work with us, you're not building just a life. You're building a legacy. You're building something that is reaching cities, nations, generations. And I believe millions of people. So I want to pray for you. If you believe that you felt that your life was broken in an area, but you believe God came tonight to touch you and tell you, huh, baby, you are not broken. You are being built. Would you raise your hand with me so I know who I'm talking to? And if it's okay with your hands raised, would you just look around the room and look at how many people that God was tugging on and the enemy was punking with the same thing. The enemy's punking you, telling you what you're not. And I want to let you know God is in heaven telling you who you are. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray for each and every person with their hand raised. God, I don't think you put me here on accident tonight. I know that you put me here on purpose because you are a God of divine intention. You stopped a plane on a runway months ago because you're the God that goes out before us and people with hurting hearts and wondering minds and could it be me and do I even matter? God, you stopped heaven and earth with a resounding yes, you do. And you're telling us in heaven, you matter so much that I wanted to interrupt every regularly scheduled program and plan to let you know specifically the sound of this voice that's coming to you right now says heaven cares about you. Heaven wants you. You are purposed. You are intended. And heaven need you to stand up and fulfill the call that you know is on the inside of you. There are people waiting for you. There are people depending on you and you can't even see the ripple effect of what is going to happen when you finally stand up and take your place. But I am God of heaven and earth and I'm calling you out. I'm calling you up and I am calling you in on this very night. As of today, put your stake in the ground that you will never be the same for you are called and you are my child and I want you to live out your purpose in Jesus name I pray and everybody said amen and amen